So um, my topic will cover the overview diagnosis and management option for COVID-19 patients. I have no financial disclosures. Uh, these are the obje objectives of my talk, the history of previous pandemic, definition, epidemiology, statistics, and uh, also what will cover some uh, part of the COVID-19 uh, specific uh, uh, characteristics and diagnostic and treatment. So I'll start with how we did, like to draw a timeline of uh, why we, how we got, got here. So on 31st of December, 2019, the Chinese authority informed uh, the, um, uh, the world uh, through the WHO, WHO China uh, that there's a cluster of infections, uh, uh, which was viral pneumonias uh, that happened in Wuhan city in Hubei province in China. January 1st, they were able to locate uh, the, uh, the, that most of the cases was related to the Hunan uh, seafood, seafood market in Wuhan city. By the 7th of January, China identified the new coronavirus uh, as a cause of the outbreak. By the 9th of January, China reported their first death. And by the 15th of January, Japan and Thailand reported their first death. Um, when we got to the 23rd of January, the city of Wuhan shut down all public transportation. And by the 24th, uh, the infection uh, reached um, Japan and the United States of America. Um, on the 25th of January, also it reached, it reached uh, the continent of Europe. By the 26th, it reached the Mid Middle East. And uh, by February 11th, uh, WHO assigned the novel coronavirus its official name, which was uh, which is SARS-CoV-2, and the disease was named as COVID-19. By the 2nd of March, it reached Saudi Arabia. Uh, and by the 11th of March, WHO declared the, the COVID, that COVID-19 is an out, uh, outbreak, is a pandemic. So this is the latest numbers uh, from yesterday. This is not the latest, but actually this is from last night, uh, uh, the 18th of April at 8 p.m. As you can see, we reached 2.2 million cases around the world with uh, more than 150,000 deaths. Um, Saudi Arabia, uh, also this is from yesterday, was not updated with today's number, but uh, we reached around 8,200 cases uh, with almost 100, um, almost 100 deaths, 92 deaths yesterday. Um, this is, uh, as you can see, uh, this is what our curve looks like uh, in terms of new cases. Um, we've been, um, since the uh, application of curfew, we were able to maintain a um, decent number with not a lot of fluctuation, uh, but recently in the past, three or four, five days, uh, three or four days, you can see there is an uh, exponential increase in uh, numbers of cases. And this is probably related to the um, active screening uh, program that um, targeted some of the uh, um, neighborhoods in Riyadh, Mecca, and Medina, and also Jeddah. So we'll talk about the nomenclature. So as I said, coronavirus is the family of the RNA viruses that SARS uh, SARS-CoV-2 or the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2 uh, belongs to, and COVID-19 is the name of the disease. COVID-19, or sorry, SARS-CoV-2 is not the only novel, uh, not the only coronavirus that infects humans. And matter of that fact, there is seven uh, human coronaviruses, four of them uh, which cause only mild symptoms and mostly upper respiratory tract infection. Uh, the SARS uh, was uh, one of the first uh, coronaviruses that caused severe diseases, was followed by MERS-CoV and now SARS-CoV-2. We had previous pandemics uh, in the past with uh, um, uh, deaths that exceeds a million. The most recent pandemic was the H1N1 influenza A pandemic which caused the estimated deaths of 100 to 500,000 deaths. Uh, and um, uh, the, the previous pandemic also that caused significant amount of deaths was the influenza A H1N1 Spanish flu, uh, which was uh, happened between 1918 and 1920, which caused 20 to 50 million deaths. And uh, during the Spanish flu, uh, the, we learned about uh, the concept of flattening the curve. Uh, and it's highlighted here uh, as an example between Philadelphia and St. Louis. 
Philadelphia, when Philadelphia got first infected with uh, the H1N1 uh, Spanish flu uh, in September 17th, and they start to apply the, the social distance, distancing intervention uh, in October 3rd. So there was a delay in the application of social distancing, and that's resulted in a peak uh, and exp exp exponential growth of cases uh, in Philadelphia and uh, resulted in overwhelming the healthcare system and the healthcare system collapsed. On the other hand, St. Louis, uh, they had their first case on October 5th, and they enacted the social distancing on October 7th. And you can see the curve of cases is different between St. Louis and Philadelphia. And this is, we can see this now in the world, and I'll show you in, few, in the next few slides, um, the differences between the countries uh, and the number of cases. Um, I'm going to touch base about the R0 uh, concept. Um, the R0 concept is the infection rate uh, of a specific virus. As you can see, the COVID-19 uh, was assigned an R0 between 2 and 2.5. What, what, what this means that if a patient got infected with COVID-19, they will spread that infection to 2.5 patient, uh, uh, patients, so 2 to 3 patients. So if we take if we decided that the R0 for COVID-19 is 2.5, as you can see, the number um, uh, grow from 2.5 to 6 within five uh, days, which is uh, the incubation period of the virus, or the immediate incubation period. As you can see, then they will, uh, will spread to 15 patients, then 38 patients, then 97, 244, all the way to 59,000. And this happens within only six weeks. So if if the virus has a higher or not, the infectivity rate uh, gets higher and higher. Um, this uh, graph um, uh, highlights the importance of uh, application of social distancing measures. So if you apply the social distancing measures um, uh, after three, after four or five weeks, it doesn't affect the total um, uh, infection rate in the, in the community. So uh, this is, as you can see on the left-hand side here, uh, if you do only school closure, 60%, an estimation of 60% of your population will get infected with COVID-19. But if you apply all measure by week one, then the, the, um, the, um, uh, it's expected that uh, you will get only uh, between five and 10% of your population, population get infected with COVID-19. So as you get have delays, even with all measures, uh, the infection rate uh, throughout the community and the population will get higher and higher. So it is extremely important to apply the social distancing early on and the, uh, and the um, Early on, when 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 you get when you get a, a member of your population infected with COVID-19, this highlights the difference as well. As you can see, the the sorry, as you can see here, there are multiple uh, graphs, and um, this shows the um, the coronavirus deaths uh, between different countries. As you can see, the the curve is different between Spain and let's say here uh, even China. Uh, as you can see, the the Chinese curve is a bit, uh, it's more flattened than the Spanish or French uh, uh, curves. And the reason why China began the strict lockdown um, after about 30 days of their first cases, while, while Spain and uh, France had, they waited until they had 200 mortality before they uh, enacted the lockdown. China was, and they had, cases in the, uh, sorry, not 30 days, but 30 deaths. After 30 deaths, they, they um, enacted the strict lockdown. Other countries like Belgium, which has a very flat curve, have enacted, and Korea as well, have enacted some of these measures earlier on. Uh, this is the daily confirmed cases uh, and a comparison between different countries. As you know, um, Saudi Arabia have uh, enacted a very strict measures early on after our first few cases, we had a curfew and, uh, throughout the country. And as you can see, our curve here is, is much flatter than um, the Spanish curve or the Italian or the UK, especially also in the United States. Also, I want to highlight the New Zealand curve as well. 
uh, same thing, they applied very strict uh, epidemiological measures and they were able to bend the curve and now to get their cases below 10, uh, 10 pa uh, uh, patients uh, daily. Uh, our curve here start to have uh, an increase uh, uh, and spike, and this is probably again related to the um, uh, the active screening in the community. Uh, same thing, it's similar to South Korea. They had this spike, but then immediately after they did a lot of screening, it went down, and this is probably what will happen with Saudi Arabia. So what is the incubation period uh, of the uh, SARS-CoV-2? Um, it's about two, two to 14 days. There's some report that goes uh, states that it stays active to up to 21 days, uh, but uh, the agreed upon um, incubation period by the CDC and WHO is 14 days with a mean of 6.4 days before starting uh, before we start seeing symptoms. Um, the transmission of the uh, COVID-19 is mainly respiratory droplets, fomite uh, and airborne uh, during aerosolized generating procedures such as uh, intubation, chest compressions, uh, or if the patient is in high flow uh, mask or BiPAP, uh, high flow nasal cannula or BiPAP. Um, the symptomatology of the COVID-19, uh, the most common symptom is fever, which uh, goes between 83 to 98%, fatigue about 70%, dry cough between 46 to 82%, shortness of breath is about 31%, and myalgia up to 44%. There are some other symptoms which is less common, such as pharyngitis, headache, productive cough, GI symptoms, hemoptysis, anosmia, aguesia, and pink eye. Uh, we're not sure if these are actually less common or we see them less in the hospital since only the sicker patients comes to the hospital. There's a lot of reports that anosmia happens even after admission uh, in some of those patients, but those are some of the symptoms that uh, you guys have uh, to look out for. I want to highlight the GI symptoms as well uh, since there's so, some, uh, many reports that, uh, reports that some patients present to the hospital with only GI symptoms and no respiratory symptoms, and they found to have uh, changes on their CT scans of their lungs, uh, but the presenting symptoms were only GI symptoms. The severity um, of COVID-19 uh, varies widely. Uh, some patients are, most of the patients actually, they either asymptomatic or have very mild symptoms. That's account for about 80% of the patients. 15% uh, has only medium symptoms, which is cough, shortness of breath, uh, dyspnea on exertion, and 5% uh, has severe symptoms and require ICU admission. The mortality rate uh, varies uh, between countries. Uh, so worldwide, it's about 2.3 to 3.8%. As you can see, Wuhan had a higher uh, uh, mortality rate when uh, compared to the, Hub the whole Hubei province. And this is probably related to a healthcare system um, uh, uh, overwhelm. If the healthcare system is overwhelmed, then the mortality rate uh, goes up. And as you can see, this is highlight the same thing. Um, uh, the Italian and Sp Italian, Spanish, and French healthcare system are very overwhelmed currently, and you can see that the case fatality is about 10 to 13 percent, whereas uh, and the same thing goes for the United Kingdom and Belgium. Uh, whereas if you go to China, it's about 5.5 percent. Saudi Arabia case fatality rate is only 1.2 percent, and the deaths per hundred thousand people population is only 0.26 percent, which is the good news. And this is where we stand around the world in terms of case fatality rate. As you can see, uh, we're less, we're some, one of the few countries that less than um, 1% uh, case fatality rate. The death rate of COVID-19 is less than the, uh, the other uh, respiratory uh, viruses such as SARS, which was 9.6% and MERS up to 34%. The H1N1 swine flu, uh, the 2009 swine, uh, H1N1 uh, pan, uh, pandemic uh, uh, resulted in only 0.02% deaths. The risk factor for severe illnesses uh, are age and comorbidities. Uh, as you can see here, uh, the, the older the patient, the higher the death rate in all, the all causes death rate. As you can see in the, in the uh, pediatric population was they had no fatalities and this is from the Chinese um, uh, reports 
uh, but as you get to 70 or 80 percent, uh, 80 years old, you have about 14.8 percent mortality rate. The comorbidities that associate with increased risk um, for mortality are cardiovascular diseases, uh, which has uh, was asso which associated with the highest risk of mortality, chronic respiratory uh, diseases, hypertension, diabetes, chronic kidney diseases, and cancer. How, we, how do we diagnose uh, COVID-19? The two modalities that's available are the reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction, which is the RT-PCR of a nasopharyngeal swab or serological testing, which is a blood test. And this is um, still under development in the US. Uh, in the US. Abbott have started sending uh, some of the serological testing uh, machine to some of the hospitals and some of the uh, clinics. So in the US, it start to be available. Uh, the limitation of the uh, RT-PCR is the sensitivity of the test. So the sensitivity of the test uh, uh, reported to be about 71% uh, in one of the Chinese reports. Uh, as you can see, they had um, they uh, studied 51 patients and they found that 15 of the 51 patients had uh, an initial uh, negative uh, test, but then when they tested them two days later, they were positive. And this is probably related to two things. One, the technique of the swab. You have to perform the swab correctly. So it has to go all the way to the nasopharynge, to the, to the uh, posterior nasopharynx, and has to be uh, done in right technique. And, and the second thing is the viral load. So if you have less symptoms or milder symptoms, probably your viral load is on the lower side. And then, and because of that, you will get a higher uh, uh, false negative uh, uh, testing in those patient population. The other testing is the serological testing. The limitation of this uh, serological testing is that on average, patient would need about 14 days to start developing antibodies against um, uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, they test, uh, it's an ELISA test uh, for an I IgM and IgG. There was a study that was that looked at uh, 58 patients uh, with clinical radiograph radiographic diagnosis of COVID-19 who had negative RT-PCR tests. They found that 93% has a positive IgM testing. So it's more sensitive than RT-PCR in some settings. Um, also, uh, there, uh, there is a 52, uh, 525 cases uh, was tested and they found 397 positive RT-PCR and 128 negative RT-PCR. Uh, of the positive uh, RT-PCR, they um, found that only 352 had uh, tested positive uh, uh, with the serological testing, which gives it a lower sensitivity than the previous study. So it's about 88.6%. Uh, um, and some of those patients, some of the patients that tested positive, they had both IgM and IgG antibodies. Of the negative patients, um, 12 tested positive, positive for uh, RT-PCR, which gives it a specificity of 90.63%. There's also um, patient COVID po positive patient has uh, a higher rate of co-infection. Um, it was reported by the California Department of Health that 22% of those patients who had was infected with other respiratory virus, uh, were RSV or flu. So there, some some. Um, so what this tells us that if you have a patient that you were concerned about COVID nineteen and you swab them and you found that they have they're positive for the flu or they're positive for a different um, a respiratory infection, that this does not rule out COVID nineteen. So you have to test for COVID nineteen as well. Other laboratory testing uh, that should probably be sent for those patients and also can predict a higher uh, rate of mortality is lymphocytes. A uh, patient with lymphopenia has a higher risk of mortality. LFTs, again, elevated liver enzymes also associated with higher rate of mortality. Same thing goes for the elevated LDH and elevated inflammatory markers, CRP and ferritin. Elevated D-dimer, more than uh, one microgram per ml, elevated prothrombin, proponent, uh, CPK and acute uh, and elevated creatinine. 
the elevated inflammatory biomarker like such as C-reactive protein and ferritin, this is probably should be sent um, um, routinely um, because it can, um, uh, and also as, as well, also with the d dimer because this is, can tell you that the patient is going into a cytokine storm uh, syndrome, which is a secondary HLH, and that will uh, lead us on using different uh, treatments and different medications. Uh, regarding imaging, uh, chest x-ray remains the first line uh, imaging, although it's not sensitive, the sensitivity is 59%. So normal chest x-ray does not rule out COVID-19, uh, but a positive chest x-ray can help out uh, with the diagnosis. Um, the most common um, uh, sign is bilateral peripheral lower zone airspace opacities. Um, and this is also some example of chest x-ray. As you can see, there's some airspace opacities on the peripheral side here. Um, and this is, this is what uh, a chest x-ray for COVID-19 might look like. CT scan is much sensitive. The sensitivity is 86%. Uh, and the most common finding is patchy peripheral and basal ground glass opacities. Some centers in China used it uh, on a routine basis, but um, that uh, is not recommended. Um, and the reason being that it often is not, will not change your management and is associated with unnecessary risk to staff as staff exposure, risk of transmission and transient and required doc, uh, decontamination of the radiology equipment, which is a very time consuming. Um, but there are some indications uh, for CT scan. Uh, one of the first indications is rule out abscess or empyema, which you can use point of care ultrasound for. And the second um, indication is rule out other causes of hypoxemia, such as pulmonary embolism. And I want to highlight that patients that has COVID-19, they have a high risk um, of developing venothermal embolism. So if the patient start to get worse after um, a period of improvement, you have to think about PE in those patients. The treatment for asymptomatic and mild patients is uh, mainly symptomatic treatment, analgesia, and antipyretic. And also, uh, the most important thing is self isolation, either at home or in the Ministry of Health quarantine. For severe and critical pa uh, uh, patients, it's, it remains supportive care is the uh, main uh, management for those patients. And also um, um, avoid this of hypervolemia as it's associated with worse outcome. Um, for regarding the pharma, uh, pharmacotherapy, so the um, there are some stages of the illness uh, of COVID nineteen. As you can see, there's stage one, which is early infection; stage two is pulmonary phase; and stage three is hyperinflammation phase. This is not proven by any studies, but this is um, what uh, uh, is a proposal by one of the one of the physicians. Um, uh, who had some experience with this. So as you can see, the, the, during the viral response phase or the viral replication phase, uh, the main st potential therapies are antivirals such as remdesivir and, um, uh, and also chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, which are anti-malaria and uh, plasma transfusion, uh, uh, convalescent plasma transfusions. And the later phase, which is the host inflammatory response phase, which is a second similar to site, which is a cytokine storm or a secondary HLH, um, you would need corticosteroids, human immunoglobulin, or IL-6 inhibitors. Um, and this is you can diagnose it with elevated inflammatory markers, as we mentioned, such as CRP, LDH, IL-6, D-dimer, and ferritin. Um, I will talk about uh, every one of these medications and show the evidence this, uh, that we have so far. This is how those medication works. So the chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine inhibits the membrane infusion and, uh, and endocytosis. The lupinavir and uh, duravir uh, inhibits the uh, three uh, chemotrypsin-like protease. So it inhibits the proteolysis and ribivirin and uh, the other antivirals inhibits the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. And the uh, tuculizumab, which is an IL-6 inhibitor, binds the IL-6 receptors and prevents IL-6 receptor activation and inhibits IL-6 signaling. 
So we'll speak about the, antivi the antivirals initially. Uh, so lupinavir and ritonavir is antiretrovirals and the evidence so far does not, it actually suggests against its use in COVID-19 and this is per the surviving sepsis campaign guidelines. Remedesivir uh, was developed as a treatment option for Ebola virus, and it's an adenosine nucleotide analog, which, as, uh, as I mentioned, interferes with the action of viral RNA dependent RNA polymerase. In vitro study shows activity against SARS CoV 2 and MERS CoV. And there's currently uh, two phase three clinical trials uh, in Wuhan and the US. Um, one of them uh, published a a case series. Uh, it's not a clinical trial uh, and was published in New England Journal of Medicine. Um, this study uh, received a lot of uh, news coverage and it was shown as that, that the treatment is very effective, but this study is very flawed. First of all, it was written by an employee of the pharmaceutical company. That we it did not have any control um, uh, arm, so we don't know if the harm that was reported is, if there's any harm that was done by the medication, uh, or if there's any benefit of the medication, because we don't have any control. And it was subject, subjected to many biases. Uh, just an example here. So some of these, from some of the patients that were enrolled, patients that had, um, were on ambient air, so room air, and uh, were included as well. And low flow oxygen, 10% was disturbed, but they probably, the 12 patient out of the, um, the total number, um, probably those patients did not need any medication to begin with. So with supportive care, those patients probably would be fine. Uh, the question raised here on the invasive patient because they reported, reported about 56% um, uh, extubation and discharge. Uh, but the other patients that were not extubated, they were not counted as death. Um, uh, so we don't know their outcome. Um, as you can see here that the, uh, the program was designed and conducted by the sponsor, uh, Gilead uh, Sciences, and the initial draft and the manuscript was prepared by the writer, a writer employed by the Gilead Science. Uh, so um, this, I would, I, would, I would be cautious about using this uh, article as an evidence. So we still need the randomized control trial to see if this patient has any, uh, if this medication has any benefits. The second medication is chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. There's some benefits reported in vitro study and low quality observational studies. Uh, there's also a report from Marseille um, for azithromycin and hydroxychloroquine that showed some benefits in small non-randomized clinical trials. Um, there was a trial, a randomized control trial that was just published. It's ahead of publication actually. Um, it did not show any it did not show any benefit of hydroxychloroquine and actually showed uh, some, uh, uh, some harm as well. Hydroxychloroquine is still in, uh, being used in some guidelines. So our Ministry of Health guideline has uh, hydroxychloroquine to be started, to be considered in, um, in uh, mild to moderate patient and to be started in severe patients. Um, and, um, also, there's a consideration uh, to use um, alternative therapy like uh, lopinavir, uh, ritonavir, and um, but the we as as we discussed, we still have no strong evidence uh, to support this. This is also in the uh, Brigham uh, Woman Hospital, um, uh, a Harvard Harvard affiliated hospital. Also, they it treats their guidelines. Um, to use hydroxy hydroxychloroquine um, uh, and uh, remdesivir in those patients, but their patients were enrolled in um, two trials. Um, and also uh, in pregnant patients, they also have a consideration for using hydroxychloroquine. The, um, the message that I'm trying to say here that we, we are still using them uh, per our guideline and we should probably stick to our guidelines. So if the hospital decided to use uh, hydroxychloroquine for those patients, we should probably use those, those, um, uh, the hydroxychloroquine uh, as a therapy, but we have to keep an, an, an open mind about and um, be uh, watchful for all of the um, uh, um, uh, evidence that's gonna come uh, down the pipe very, very soon. Um, 
Um, and as of now, I think we should probably just stick to our guidelines, but uh, we should we should be uh, watchful for at least the side effects of those of those medications. Other therapies that was suggested uh, in some other articles, such as statin, and was found to be uh, was the thought or the hypothesis it's cardioprotective. So patients, especially patients with cardiac involvement uh, of COVID-19, um, statin uh, was was um, suggested by some expert to be started. Uh, Tocilizumab, as I said, it's a monoclonal, monoclonal antibody to IL-6, um, and this is being used to treat cytokine release syndrome. Um, sorry, I, I think we have an issue with electricity. Uh, <laughs> Interferon beta uh, is an immunomodulatory enhancement of innate and adaptive immunity and it's also being used in patients with lymphopenia. Other therapies, uh, antibiotics, antifungus, and anticoagulation uh, should be considered in patients, especially with patients that have um, high D-dimer. So there's a study that was done and sh uh, to look at uh, the um, sensitivity and specificity, specificity and a positive predictive value of high D-dimer and was found that patient that has a D-dimer of above 1.5, which is 1,500 uh, nanogram, uh, had a predictive, a, a positive predictive value of 70, uh, 70 and a sensitivity of 85 percent and 88 percent for renal thromboembolism. So if you have a patient with an extremely high D-dimer, you should think about um, two things. Um, one is, um, uh, so the first thing is venal thromboembolisms, uh, or, um, sorry, and um, other causes of uh, elevated D-dimer, such, such as thrombogenic uh, DIC in those patients. And some experts suggest um, using uh, therapeutic uh, heparin if there's no contraindication for the patient that has a very high D-dimer. Um, the other thing also I want to highlight that the D higher D-dimer also was uh, associated with an ex a very high mortality rate. Um, as you can see here, the D-dimer, elevated D-dimer uh, was associated with um, um, higher uh, renal thromboembolism, also uh, high APTT, also associated with uh, higher renal thromboembolism, higher platelets uh, was not different, and uh, um, lower lymphocytes was associated with high VTE. And this is probably related to a thrombogenic DIC uh, rather than just a DVT or PE, uh, an isolated DVT or PE. This is my contact. Sorry about the electricity. Thank you so much.